and 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 normally and the vast majority of the time these are empty boxes there is not burials in them however uh, many people think there are and so they tend to be targets for vandalism because they think there's treasure or you know morbid curiosity or what have you um, so anyway according to the story I heard um, this was uh, Vandalized. Now, also, the, 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 the fence had been previously damaged by a tree, maybe, or I don't know the history of that. But well, the, the there was a piece last missing. section of the fence over there was totally missing. Right. But then there was more of it down. There was and more you, of it down. You had the pieces in safekeeping. And so then, um, after the, the, the tomb was restored, um, the uh, metal work was done later. Thank you. Um, so, um, but anyway, um, this was a, a really uh, um, interesting project, and so, um, yeah, this, this metal work was not all here because it would have been almost impossible to work on if it was. And so, um, I created like a flat platform here. What had occurred is there was a big piece, uh, well, you can see the upper piece was solid, and then they had put like plywood on the bottom. Um, now, to, when they fix these, they're only two, it's only about two inches thick. And um, it is all joined together. However, what I did when I reconstructed is that I put dry masonry support under it solid. So, like, if you came on top of this and jumped it on it like a little kid might, um, you know, messing around, it's not going to break because it has solid support everywhere. So if you just spanned it like that, then just anything that hit it hard, it would be very prone to re-breakage. The marble gets much weaker over time, and it tends to get more brittle. And um, anyway, it was a cool project. I'm glad it still looks good. It certainly could use um, a treatment of D2 if you wanted to, you know, keep it clean. But um, you know, that's... to give you a financial perspective, um, the cost to restore the top was five thousand dollars, and the cost to rebuild a fence, which was done in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, used to be the steel capital of the South, another five thousand dollars. Okay. Okay, and the, the painting of the fence was done by me and two other people by hand and took several days. <laughs> right. Well, you found a metal worker that did it who was not a expert on historic restoration, so you could have spent a lot more. Depends on who you hire, and I know you also had a price quote that was significantly higher from another company, and we don't have to go into the details about the whole history there, but, um, you know, like anything, um, uh, there's, there's different options, but anyway, the results, um, you know, are, are holding up, and, um, you know, and it, and it looks good, so um, uh, it was a big project. And so where are the... Uh, first of all, it's too small, and it was never intended for that. It's a box tomb, which is symbolic of what a burial would be. Uh, normally, a burial would be underneath. There's a solid slab, most commonly under these, and that would be kind of like a ledger stone. So the burial would go underground like a traditional burial. And this is a structure that was put on top of it after the fact. That, that would be most common. Um, there might be some situations, especially in the southern states, where they do above-ground burials. More likely, probably in African American cemeteries, but a historic box tomb like this, it's not the it's, it's not big enough. The inside dimensions are not big enough for a casket, and, and it rarely is there a burial in one. It's not. I, I, I'm sure there could be in some situations, but for the most part, they're empty boxes. So this style is an older style, and you'll see these. In fact, the oldest gravestone in uh, one of the oldest. In Actually, all of the oldest ones in Connecticut that were for um, kind of the important, um, you know, kind of almost the royalty of the day, the, the ministers or, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the the two oldest stones I know of, the oldest one, that, the oldest readable stone I know of in America is in Windsor, Connecticut, and uh, Palisado Cemetery, a place I still work, and it's uh, dated 1644, and it's a box tube like this. It's not marble, it's made of sandstone. Uh, but it's a really dense sandstone, and it's in really good condition, and you can pull it up online, it's Reverend Hewitt, and it is dated 1644, and they inscribed another, one side later. Um, on, on Sometimes on these, they're carving on the sides of them and not on the top, so it depends on the era. But this was from the old world, this was the style brought over from the old world. And so also the Knight's Tomb that I restored at Jamestown, and they think 1644, 
27 is a ledger stone, and so that it looks about the size of the top here. However, it's they call it a gray limestone. It looks like slate. It's about four inches thick. It's not um, perfectly symmetrical, and it's unclear if it originally was elevated as a box, and it certainly may have been, since that was a typical size. If you have only the top and it's set like on the ground, like on uh, like rails or blocks, then it's called a ledger. Uh, but if it's elevated, it's a box tomb. There's another style that's legs and it's open and it looks like a Parsons table and that's like a table tomb. And um, I don't know if you have any of those here or not. Um, any questions or comments? Okay. Well, we could uh, continue. Um, just looking down the hill from here, what we see is hilly terrain, which is not uncommon for historic burial, burial grounds because um, the land was more difficult to use for other, uh, other things. So a lot of times they would pick a piece of land that wasn't ideal for other, you know, for building a house or for agriculture. And so, um, you know, not always, but it's not, it's pretty common for hilly terrain. And so one of the solutions is to, um, like build walls, like retaining walls, and basically make terracing. And you'll see this done quite often in historic um, cemeteries, and you see a lot in Macon at Rose Hill there as well, which is very hilly as the name indicates. And so one of the issues with this is that if it, there's a lot of pressure pushing against the um, inside from the soil, and many of these walls were not made, designed really well for the longevity, and I know there's one out on the way out, the way you guys walked up, and it looks like that one was never restored still, right? That wall that's blowing out right on the road. I don't know if something was done on the inside, but okay, yeah, so that, that yeah, sure, that yeah. was that's an interesting thing to look at. But, uh, there are some that are completely crumbled right down there, too. Right. That have fallen over. And these pathways are really interesting, and the, the walkways that, you know, are like cobbles, and those are. Um, Original, or do you have any you, idea? You may not have even seen them when you were here. One of the things our volunteers have done is took over a year and a half is reset them, identify them. Yeah. And find, no, they, they were some, some of them were up under up to the foot of the grass. Oh wow! And we cleared, cleared them all out. With, uh, with okay. Yeah. All right, we'll move this way. shapes and sizes. A lot of them were made out of Indiana limestone. They were also made out of marble. The biggest tree stump style monument, also this is a woodman, a woodman of the world, which was a fraternal organization, you know, like the Masons or the Odd Fellows, um, and they tended to have monuments that looked like you know, trees with the name Woodman. Um, but later, especially when you get into the earlier 1900s, they had monuments that were more typical styles, but they often had the symbol um, still on the monument. And so the biggest um, tree stump style monuments that I know of in America are not made of uh, marble or limestone. They're made of sandstone, and they're in a small town, Columbus, Montana. And um, I was out there a couple, um, last year, year before last, um, two years ago. And, um, and uh, I can't remember. I think it might have been last year. I've been out there twice. And they are about uh, 12 or 14 feet high, um, a few of them. And in fact, they were so kind of prolific in their day that a couple of them were uh, carved and then transported by train cross country to one of the world's fairs to uh, be on display in the very early 1900s. Uh, but anyway, uh, tree stump monuments are interesting. And you can see how the bottom looks like logs. Um, and this appears to be a marble. Um, I think it's Georgia marble. Um, and we'll, we'll look at some other uh, as we go. So, um, okay, so we can continue. Uh, so we have a lot of sit. My daddy was in World War I in France. Mm. 
and up until he died, he was in his late 70s, he yeah. had squat, and he learned how to do that in the Fox Islands because he said he could not sit down and he had to squat. Oh, whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, that's neat. That's really neat. I'll always remember that. It is the top cleaner for historic stone. It is what they use at Gettysburg and uh, most historic sites. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So, um, and, 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 the clean, and, and these could even get cleaner, but, I mean, they're clean enough. I mean, that so that, you know, there's... Uh, it's kind of a range in what it means when you claim something. So it's not necessarily 100% uh, the color it originally started. Uh, so here's a good example of a, of a tablet stone that, that fell and broke into a bunch of pieces. Tablet stones are uh, oftentimes thin, and the thin two inch thick marble tablet stones. You guys did this late. I, I don't think I'm just concerned about that. I don't think you did it after the fact. What's that? I don't think you did. I, okay, but, I don't recall. Well, it, maybe it doesn't look like your handiwork because the, the joint is not filled in. I don't well. think this is something I, I did. But anyway, um, it, it, it also down here, I certainly wouldn't leave something open like that if, if it had to end up like yeah. that. Okay, but anyway, you didn't do it. Didn't do it. <laughs> the earliest gravestones in America tend to be tablet stones, which are one piece stones that just stick in the ground. Like the style, everyone knows, like the military stones, like Arlington National Cemetery, but those are much more modern, marble usually, or that, and modern, very modern times, granted. But um, tablet stones originally were about a third in the ground, and that held up the rest of it, so they're monolithic, they're just one-piece stones. Um, but as time went on, they started to add bases to them, and they're called socket bases, and the stone fits into the base, and it's keyed in. And so um, it, call, it can be called um, a slotted base, a socket base, and, and the, the, it could be called a keyway where the stone fits in. And ultimately it's a mortise and tenon joint, so the stone is a tenon, the base is a mortise, they fit together, and that was the way they came up with a solution to hold something so thin up with a base. Okay, but so as time went on, this style kind of became obsolete. I, I will also mention that um, this is a great example right here with the footstone still intact. And in this cemetery with the hilly terrain and the kind of terracing and things, you have a lot of footstones still intact. But a lot of cemeteries have been removed for maintenance and then you lose some of the um, integrity and the aesthetics and, and it's harder to interpret and understand how it originally looked. But so that, that in, um, in, in, in this era, in colonial into Victorian era, generally, um, professionally made uh, gravestones were sold as pairs and so you would have the headstone and the footstone the footstone usually about six feet away unless it was a child then it would often be about four feet away and usually the footstone would have the initials of the deceased occasionally bigger footstones would have the whole name and um, but again so it shows you right where the grave is um, the traditions coming from the old world would be the deceased were laid to rise or to, to lay to rest excuse me so they would sit up for resurrection toward the rising sun and that's the east-west orientation toward the rising sun and so that was you know out of the you know biblical verse and everything so um, so uh, anyway you have this um, you know complete um, you know kind of plot now also we have all these plot enclosures and that was another thing that became popular not so much in the 17 but more in the 1800s um, and they allowed it generally at many cemeteries, including big garden cemeteries, which became um, popularized at all over America starting in 1831 with Mount Auburn in uh, the Boston area, uh, Cambridge, just over the Charles, um, in, in Cambridge, Mass, and that's known as being the first garden cemetery. And they allowed enclosures like this back then in garden cemeteries, but as time went on, maintenance became very difficult. And so as you can see also that, you know, a tree would fall and stuff like that and damage these. And then of course, over time, the metals, some of them rusted and there was other issues as well. And so many of these have been removed and taken down, but it's always nice when you have these enclosures still intact and then you, you know, can understand what was here historically. And we see down here also that, you know, some of them were very simple and more crude and they had these like big, um, like balusters of blocks in the corner and then just connected by basically a piece of pipe. Um, so there was many different versions of these 
um, but they were um, quite popular to kind of separate your land and mark it out and, you know, really from a different view. And generally these became disallowed and discouraged. And once you get into the modern sections, you don't have anything like this. It's not allowed. There's regulations and the maintenance would be uh, too problematic. Um, any, uh, the upper base um, inches um, and it's a big headstone um, and a lot of weight there so um, it was actually dangerous we thought it was going to fall well so. so the thing is this monuments conventional shaped monuments like this um, they, they generally fall forward or backward they don't fall side to side and so it's cantilevered a little on the side but it's not really structural Another thing that um, people don't realize, but that a large percentage of, especially the biggest monuments, um, have nothing holding them together. They're just stacked elements. And the, the tradition was often, um, especially when they got even bigger, like the monument in the middle of town, like the Civil War monument or what have you, um, and when they moved over to Granite especially, they generally just put like a ribbon of lead around it and stack the pieces on it. And there's usually no pin. And that would be also indicated by not far from here at Oakland Cemetery where they had a tornado. I mean, I don't remember the year, but uh, I'd say about a decade ago. Um, and it, it, it actually took some really big obelisk and just slid them right off their bases. And these things were massive, incredibly heavy stones. And they never would have moved, but that shear, that wind from the side, because there was no pinning, there was nothing holding them structurally. And they literally, a couple of them just shot right off. So. Uh, and that's bronze, but they, they repaired them, but uh, quite interesting. Um, so we can look at a lot of different things. Here's a style marker you're not going to see in modern times. It's a raised marker, but a round top, but especially looking at the raised lettering. And you'll see this on a lot of historic stones, but you'll almost never see it on a modern stone. Most modern um, stones have incised lettering. The other thing here is that these are granite, and so there was a transition from marble to granite. Now we can just duck into the shade and, um, and continue and watch your step here. Um, here's some nice marble down here. You know how those are done? Do they have um, to it's one stone and they chisel it out and just, it's, uh, no kidding. yeah. <laughs> so if you mess up, you mess up. I mean, we certainly something historic, you would never, uh, I, guess, I guess there was a mistake carved in it, and um, as, they, as they say, um, you know, it is carved in stone, so um, sometimes you see mistakes that have been fixed, and they have done, do that in different ways, sometimes they'll fill in the letters and just recarve them, sometimes they'll incise it and then carve deeper. Um, Sometimes they'll fit in a little repair piece and then recarve it. That's called a Dutch pen. Um, but yeah, sometime we see historic um, mistakes. Um, so, so where's the mistake on the leak? She, she just said that. Uh, it says that she was she was born in December and died the next June, and then it says she lived to one year, five months, and nine days, which is uh, which is not the time between December and April. Is that April? June. June. There's, yeah. there's one in one of the cemeteries that they said she died November 31st. And I go, well, okay. I've never <laughs> known there was a November 31st. Yeah. It just, you know, or, or sometimes people can't read the handwriting. And one person, his name was Zuit, but they wrote it in cursive. And on a stone, it says Hewitt. Oh. So, yeah, it's. 
Those are the fun ones to find, actually. Yeah. Like, so this is a, a really uh, decoratively carved uh, marble monument, uh, really nicely done. But an interesting thing, it's a style where they incorporated it into like this tomb cover, like a ledger, and they're all built together because this has these kind of like, uh, like rails, almost like train tracks underneath and then the ends. But that um, this goes solid coverage and the monument goes on top of it. So that's a more involved style and they're kind of combining elements and you'll see many many different versions of things like this um, but these are like regional styles but this was this was quite expensive for the size of it there's a lot of pieces of stone here and it was really uh, carefully designed um, so um, that we see mostly marble here these are all marble but and these are all marble and this would be the newest stone and they gave up on the marble and they made granite a single slant on a base, it would be called. The interesting thing about this, it's a pretty typical slant marker. Um, the interesting thing about this is that, look at the black here, but it's all polished around the edge. So when they made this, and this is probably Elberton granite, Elberton uh, became the epicenter of the southern granite industry, um, went into production right around 1900. And, um, and so uh, a tremendous amount of gray came out of Elberton. Up north, Barry, Vermont would be the northern kind of counterpart, um, which is much older and larger amounts of stone came out of Barry than Elberton. Anyway, when they made this, they polished the whole face. But then in order to keep, con create contrast, they would take the polish off, they called it like dust it, um, and, um, and, and it'll make it a lighter color here. But what's occurred here now is the biological growth, the mold um, has only attached itself to the unpolished area because it's more, uh, it's able to get its tentacles in much easier. And so it's just really um, a great example of how the polish around the outside is quite clean. And also on the edges, you see the black on the top. And so these rough edges are called rock pitched. Um, and, and this surface here is called steeled, where they took off the polish. Um, and so, but it's, it's, it's showing you um, the contrast and it, the, the, the mold is growing where it can attach itself. So the polish is a big deterrent for the growth. Um, so we can continue. Now we're gonna see many different um, Revival styles. This is an old, uh, appears to be an older granite, um, and it's a, 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 a very simple kind of crude version of an obelisk. And so, as you um, get into the 1800s, you have a lot of revival movements occurring in America, and they were influencing the, the, the monuments, the memorials, and so. Um, people started to be able to travel more and, and also um, as photography became uh, available, you know, by the Civil War era, people were seeing the photos of other countries and everything. And so, you know, one of the, um, like Egyptian revival in the obelisk is very obvious and very well known. In fact, the um, uh, Mount Auburn uh, in 1831 has a, uh, a large uh, Egyptian revival kind of entrance way and that was very fashionable in that era. We're also going to see a lot of like Greek revival things including pillars and Gothic revival generally when things are very ornate and a lot of little details and and so um, these movements were all very um, uh, you know there was they were happening and they, they were significant in America and so that the styles reflected that but they were often very Americanized and they were combining different styles. They weren't true to any one form. So, um, just mentioning that. This is a very early granite. And we see this is interesting. Um, we have, and this would be called falling here. And so we have a loss of a little bit of surface, but it's not a loss of the structural integrity, but it's just a little bit of surface is coming off. And so also we have this discoloration here, which certainly appears to be um, like a lot of iron that's coming out of the stone. And there was issues with this, um, especially early on, uh, with some of the brands. And as time went on, they um, had better sourced. Um, so that's probably about it on that. We can kind of walk up, uh, probably cut our way back up to the roadway would be make sense. Um, 